when I left BlackRock, you know, which is a big asset management company, I remember one of the leaders of the Aussie business turning to be like, oh, look, Webb's going to go and do sort of, you know, some sort of tech business for cows. Like, are you going to make, you're going to do Tinder for cows? And, and, and it was clearly a very disdainful comment about, you know, why would technology be useful in agriculture? And, and I think whatever it is, five, seven years later, it, 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 this is a major industry. And it's, and in fact, it's becoming its own sector. It's not, it's not technology to facilitate agriculture. Like ag tech in and of itself is becoming similar to mining services. This is its own sector. And as recently as yesterday, when Farmers Edge IPO'd in, in Canada and immediately you know, jumped 23% in the first day, seeing, seeing a tremendous interest and excitement. I mean, we are talking about some of the most some of the most robust, consistent problems in 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 our for our society. And, and this is an existential problem. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 143 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Bhargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they you succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have Justin Webb as my guest for this episode. Describing Justin as a successful serial entrepreneur would not be doing justice to his background. He studied economics and applied mathematics at Harvard before going on to do a postgraduate MBA at Oxford. He would then take his work on the application of machine learning and AI in asset management to found and grow two hedge funds that he would later sell to Macquarie Bank and Westpac. He would then go on to found and build PacWealth Capital into a $4 billion advisory firm in the South Pacific. And he is now the co-founder and CEO of AgriWeb, which is on a mission to digitize on-farm production data. Since launching six years ago, the company now manages 15 million head of livestock across 90 million acres around the globe and recently announced a $30 million Series B round, valuing the company north of $100 million. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including AgriWeb's journey to a $100 million valuation, how to find and attract great talent, how to find your believers and early adopters, the future of ag tech, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with Justin Webb. Hi, Justin. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope that I've got something interesting to tell you and your listeners. I'm, I'm sure we have. I think this is going to be a great episode. But Justin, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Sure. So... I am Australian, five generations of, of livestock farming here in Australia, but I actually grew up overseas. My father's job took us living, almost changing countries every two years or so. So I was at boarding school from seven years old in England while they, they sort of moved around. I studied undergraduate at Harvard in the US, did applied mathematics and economics, and then sold my soul to the devil and worked in worked in Wall Street and in, in Lehman Brothers, in fact, it, where, upon graduation. And, you know, uh, obviously when all that started to go wrong, I ran away and hid in Australia, decided to come home. I founded a actually three businesses aside from the current one that I'm doing. Typically, they were based in the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence, neural nets, et cetera, into the discerning of investment ideas. So whether that was foreign exchange or, or equity, et cetera, and worked across really cool countries and places like Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste uh, to try and bring governance and, and, and structured investment for sovereign wealth funds and superannuations up there. And I went back and, and did a bit of study, did postgraduate and MBA at Oxford. And actually that, that led into my sort of current vocation, which was I, I went back to the farm finally. And, and despite not growing up crutching sheep, I, I, I was sitting at the kitchen table. My father unfortunately got quite ill, but we were making significant decisions about our farming enterprise. And I was sort of amazed that we were doing it not based off of data and 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 prediction, but off of what happened, you know, across the fence post next door and, and, and regionally. And, and, and that led to saying, well, well, hang on, look, I, you know, I didn't uh, necessarily grow up crutching sheep, but I do understand the, you know, how to run a business and, and the application of data and how important that is. And, and as I got more and more into the farming world, I understood that 
that that was something that, that, that sort of was quite pervasive. You know, farming is a data led business, but that data tends to be encapsulated and passed on in anecdotes or, you know, in the in the sort of ubiquitous notebook in the top pocket. And, and farmers have been yearning for kind of technology to help them you know, have data driven decisions. There's a bit of a misnomer around farmers not being tech savvy or tech people. And I just don't think that's true. It's, it's just the farmers demand good technology that's useful. You know, they're busy people and, and farmers and ranchers want something that's going to help them. They use you know, Facebook and Twitter are probably different uh, in the way that you and I do. They're, they're not sending, they're not sending the latest picture of of their entree to each other. You know, they're they're talking about product recommendations, operational protocols, how they run their business, what they're doing, and and that's how that community really engages with a lot of social media and technology, and 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 that really drew me in. This this confluence of of data, technology, and farming. Is, is a fascinating area because you know, we've got to feed 10 billion people by 2050. We've already cultivated more land than we need to. 50% of the Earth's surface is, is already agricultural production. And frankly, we, we have a, a carbon footprint from the, from the production of food that is, is, is too high. It's uh, you know, 20% of carbon emissions, greenhouse emissions, is, comes from agricultural production. And, and an even greater percentage of the loss of biodiversity comes from monoculture. So you know, this is a really, really robust problem that we, as a generation and as hopefully innovators, have a, have a duty to, to address. And, and that's something that's pretty, pretty exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously I want to sort of come back and spend a large portion of this interview talking about the wide engagement that you've had for AgriWeb in in the ecosystem as well. But just going back, one thing that you didn't mention that I know that you met Kevin and Chris, who I spoke to in in doing research for this interview, was your kind of background in sport, particularly with rowing. And I'm such a big believer, you know, growing up, I wanted to play cricket professionally and and those sorts of things as well. You know, I think there's such an interesting parallel between sports and, and business. I'm just really curious to understand from, I guess, your own experience with rowing and playing it at a high level as well. What are some of the, the key lessons or takeaways that you sort of took away from that that you apply to, to business or life? Well, Rohit, it's, it's, it's always terrifying when you ask for, a, you know, for some people to chat to you before an interview and I give you some lifelong friends. And, and so <laughs> <laughs> if this is the, the, worst, the worst line of questioning, then I think we're doing all right. But it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I, I probably, like you, would have loved to have played cricket professionally. But, you know, my first cricket coach, when I asked him if I, sh- if I should play cricket or row, immediately pointed me towards the boathouse. So, you know, no talent and, and did what I could. Yeah, I did, I did do a lot of rowing. I, I did it for nearly eight years at, at school and then at university, rode at Harvard, where you know, we, we had, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by some tremendously talented athletes that have gone on to win multiple gold medals and including some that have infamy in, in the world, the Winklevoss twins who, uh, who remain good friends of mine. And, you know, we had, we had an amazing time and then, yeah, carried on and, and actually rode for Australia in Australian surf boats. And, and we had some, some very good luck in the world championships. And then finally back to Oxford, where frankly, I was probably a bit old and, and crusty, but, but really enjoyed the experience of, of doing the, you know, the boat race. And, and it's where I've met some of my lifelong friends and my co-founder. So, you know, to, to your point of question, the, you know, what is, what's the translation, at least in, in my experience, Sport at a very high level involves a, a, a dedication and a commitment to the journey. You, you, it is almost impossible to be solely motivated by, you know, by the singular goal of, of winning. Like you to, to wake up and train and, and train again in the afternoon and then again in the evening for six hours a day, every day for you know, nine months on end is 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 wearing and you have to enjoy that journey you have to you know for the love of it actually be doing it and i think that's very true in in business but also in startups particularly right the 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 goal it's very difficult i think to 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 imagine that one could be an entrepreneur start a business and just have this goal of ipoing it in 10 years that's that's not going to get you through the grind. What you have to love the journey. You have to love the persistence of marginal, really small improvements. Celebrating the little wins, enduring the the dark moments. And I think 
I've certainly seen that. My, my co-founder, Kevin, who we'll probably get onto uh, later on, like I met him originally when he was going to go to university in America. And then after he'd rode for the US, he came to Oxford and, and you know, we rode together there. And he is a picture of tenacity and persistence. He's, and, and I think that's one of the traits that I find incredibly inspiring in, in all the people that, that are around me, whether it's this business or other businesses before, almost invariably they have been founded together with athletes. And, and I think that's a trait that is unusual, unusually valuable. Absolutely. And you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but your background prior to AgriWeb, you had actually started a couple of different businesses, predominantly two, two hedge funds that you had sold to Macquarie and Westpac. I'm just curious if you could sort of elaborate a little bit on what those businesses were and, and what that journey was like for you. Sure. I mean, you know, this is probably the point where, where the listeners might tune out because if I get into some of the techniques that we were using in, in applied mathematics, but, you know, we were, and I say we, so my co-founder was a roommate of mine at Harvard and he's just a phenomenally intelligent guy, also an athlete who'd been on the US ski team. And he and I had a passion for, for developing insightful models that, that frankly operated in the nonlinear space. You know, the vast majority of mathematics that we are, we collectively uh, in, in traditional education learn is linear math. Think equations, algorithms, et cetera. But, but the reality is the, that's a bit like saying, you know, non-elephant animals. The vast, you know, the vast world is explained by nonlinear mathematics. And so therefore we were very active in developing the cutting edge of tools around what, what are called evolutionary algor algorithms within neural nets that became very adaptive to identifying small differences within human psychology and equity pricing movements and foreign exchange movements. And so, you know, that's what we did. And we built up the models and, and, and our first business, which was based in Bondi above a backpackers, had 22 laptops wired together. And we actually had a visit from Bloomberg who pulled up complete with sort of security because we were the second biggest draw, uh, you know, drawdown of data in Australia. And they thought that we were trying to sort of rip off Bloomberg and they couldn't believe that this, <laughs> this wow. you know, this room with a bunch of secondhand computers were sort of pulling down so much information. Fast forward a couple of years and, and obviously you know, a bit of backing from Macquarie and then subsequently from, from a subsidiary of Westpac called Ascalon. We had one of the first Cray, or at the time, it was the most powerful supercomputer in Australia, a Cray that was built for us and shipped out. And, you know, with petabytes of data running through it, we were, we were able to really push the envelope of quantitative systematic investing. It was some pretty exciting stuff and, and the journey was, was fun. It wasn't always easy to explain to people what we were doing. We came up with some pretty interesting analogies, but yeah, you know, I think uh, it's one of those one of those ones where the adaptation of uh, of tools that aren't traditionally used in an industry have become commonplace now. You know the best hedge funds in the world, whether it's D. Shaw or Citadel or Renaissance. You know they the the ones that have the best returns in the world are all quantitative hedge funds that are using this. So there's clearly something in there. Absolutely. And so you mentioned that you know it wasn't until sort of the early 2010s that you came back to Australia and you know, unquote, went back on the farm. What was that, what was that journey like? Because I, I imagine it was, you know, a bit of a transition to go from Oxford and rowing and launching head funds to, to I guess, going back and, and running the family business. Yeah, I suppose when you say it like that, it sort of makes it sound much more glorified than and <laughs> <laughs> I was hardly Mr. Mr. Darcy. It, 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 I think I'd always had a deep love for, you know, my family's, my, my, particularly my father's side of the family, he had always instilled going back to visit, you know, visit our farming roots and, and go and spend holidays. And, you know, I would try and go and jackaroo and, and probably make more mistakes and create more work than I was helping. But there's, there's something about ranching farming that is so grounded in, in hard work and, and, and not just hard work, but, but, you know, seeing the product of one's labors very directly, that feedback loop is really evident. And, and I think there's something that's you know, kooky and traditional, but it, it, that country ethic of working with animals, of, of understanding the value of the land, of recognizing that, you know, 
you have to care for the land and the land will look after you, that there is a great degree of unpredictability. You know, in Australia, more than most, we see it with weather, droughts, fires, you know, natural uh, impact that, that's just out of, out of control. Uh, but what you can do is, is really focus on working hard in a business, in, those, in controlling the things that you can. So when I went back to do it, it was almost a sort of, you know, lifelong vocation that, that regrounded me in, in a great, great space. And I might add just the experience of having our customer base, AgriWeb's customer base, the prospect of that being farmers was something that I've just couldn't, I couldn't deny was, was infinitely more rewarding. You know, this, the, the, the global financial industry is, you know, it is what it is. And there's plenty of stories and movies and et cetera, of, of fast moving people and, and, um, and shysters and, and snake oil salesmen and all sorts of things. And, and frankly, you know, a lot of that is not so awesome. And I think I, at the time, was, was sort of over trying to, to battle that, that ethical conundrum and was more interested in, in, in really enjoying every interaction. <laughs> Even when you're getting yelled at by a farmer, they've probably got a pretty good reason to yell at you. So, yeah, uh, uh, that's what took me back. And if I read correctly, I read an article that the idea for AgriWeb came from a meeting, from you sitting in a meeting and kind of hearing, I guess, the lack of data that was being used. Do you mind kind of sharing where that sort of kernel for the, for the idea came from? Yeah, I mean, as, as I sort of described earlier on, it's, it, it's not just a narrative to, you know, to sound good at startup meetups, et cetera. It, it, it was the reality. In, on our farming business, we, we had a, several consultants and agronomists and livestock consultants, et cetera, around the table. And, and between them, they had you know, certainly decades, if not centuries of experience. And, and when I was poking around at the, well, you know, okay, fine. And, and for your listeners that you know, might not necessarily come from come from the country, but are looking at, you know, where are they discerning their own kernel of idea and their own motivation? Like this was a very personal problem. Like we needed to make decisions about that hopefully would result in profitability or increased profitability of the farm. And so we were making real investments. And when I was poking it, well, okay, if we, you know, spend X amount on pasture improvements, what is the expected increase in yield, which in, you know, for our case was literally the amount of grass grown or the kilogram dry matter per hectare. Or, you know, if we're going to spend money on improving genetics, which, you know, by uh, buying new bulls, well, fine, but, you know, what are we expecting to see the increase and, and what will, you know, will they put on more weight? Will they be more fertile? What, what, what's the increase? And there was a lot of kind of almost, you know, uh, metaphoric, like, hair ruffling or patting me on the head being like oh the young buck you don't know what farming is and that's not how it works and I was like well hang on why not and and that was really the the, the kernel of it and then you know you you mentioned Kevin my Kevin Baum my co-founder and this was actually you know on a holiday back while I was still at Oxford and when I, I flew back over I, we we spent many 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 hours on on rowing machine next to each other and 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 to fill to fill the boredom we we were talking about starting businesses and he was fascinated with this concept and in particular you know something that stuck with me for with him was he'd grown up in in silicon valley gone to stanford a lot of his friends had gone to go and work at you know at the time the the sort of advent of social media was almost steepest part of the S curve for, for those businesses. And he sort of said, well, look, you know, when I look at the world of, of where I can be involved in a hundred years time, will people still be using Facebook? Maybe, probably not, but in a hundred years time, are people going to really need, you know, need food and, and, and need an efficient production of food? Absolutely. And that's a real problem. So that's what, that's where the penny dropped of, wow, like what we're dealing with on a very local basis, i.e. at my own farm kitchen table, is scalable, not even just to Australia, but scalable, scalable globally. And, and clearly there was 
you know, as we did research, agriculture is the least digitized of the least digitized and, and in particular livestock farming, because it's so fragmented, you know, the, the average herd size in the United States is 46. And to put that in context, the average herd size in Australia is sort of over 500. It's, it, you know, there are a hundred million head of cattle in the United States and with an average herd size of 46, it gives you that description of, you know, their, their hobby farms, they're, they're, they're not particularly sophisticated operations so but but they could be and and in order to get more from less is a productivity problem and technology is an amazing scalable solution for a productivity problem so again you know rounding back to to people that you know, might be listening and might be in early stages of finding their their business their vocation i would urge you know having a having a personal connection with the problem, having empathy for what that problem is and, and why it's impactful, it, it, it was a very powerful motivator. And, and you know, we talked a bit about persistence in terms of athletics, like that, that's a constant thing that I'm able to reach back to is, is the empathy for when people are struggling to, to leverage, you know, some sort of improvement and efficiency for their own livelihood. And, and when you can then scale that, and I don't necessarily mean scale it so that a VC is happy when you show them the total addressable market, which is great as an auxiliary benefit, but so that when you scale that to say, I can deliver value, or th- at least this concept in you know, potentially can deliver value to an enormous opportunity set, then I think you're really onto something. And then the last part is, is getting the right team together because you know, ideas without execution are, are, are plentiful. Uh, and, and so you know, finding the right team and the right chemistry between you and your your founders, it's, it's invaluable. Speaking of team members, you know, obviously you've touched on, you know, the importance of having the right team around you. And that's definitely something that both Chris and Kevin mentioned to me in, in terms of, you know, one of your superpowers is your ability to really bring on the right people with the right skill sets on. Part of that process is identifying who those people are. The other part is getting them to, to believe in your vision and mission and, and getting them to, to join on. And as you touched on with Kevin and something that he mentioned to me was, you know, obviously he didn't come from a farming background, but, you know, he felt really compelled with, with what it is that you were building. And, you know, oftentimes for a lot of early stage founders that have this really clear vision mission can be hard to translate that or to find you know, others that kind of believe in their journey as well. Do you have any advice in how to sort of structure that or, or advice in finding the people that will kind of be your sort of early adopters or, or be those believers from day one? Sure. I mean, probably you know, my turn to get, get emotional. It's wonderful to hear things like that from such great friends. I mean, I would obviously tease them when we next have a beer and say, of course, you would say my superpower was finding you. But um, <laughs> I think... To, to pass up that question that you asked in a couple of different ways, like the, you know, finding your, finding and motivating people to, you know, just jump with you is, I hope, and I, and I think something that you know, I have been able to, to do successfully a few times. It's, I think, it, I think it's about honesty. It's about openness. It's about utter belief. People tend to look you in the eye, and and if you don't believe it, like they won't believe it. And and if you're not jumping, they're certainly not going to lead it in front of you. So you know the, the the commitment, the integrity, the openness of how you approach it, whatever challenge you are you're seeking to do it with. And and I might add that it's got to be open in all ways. Like if you have a motivation that is slightly nefarious or in any way, you know, not pure, and you think, oh, I should hide that you've already lost the battle because people are, are insightful and, and you're about to, you know, you're about to make a marriage when you go into business with people. And the two that you're talking about, you know, Chris was, was and is remains one of my closest friends in the world. And, and I backed him starting his business and, and, and he is in investment and, and he backed me starting, starting this one. So whether it's Kevin joining me in the trenches of actually, you know, going into the business or whether it's Chris putting family capital as an investment, as a very early stage investment, you know, those are, you're asking people to make very personal gambles on you and, and on the vision that you have that they might not necessarily share. And, and, and so where your empathy, you know, beyond your openness and, and your honesty, your empathy has to be there, like understanding the commitment that they are making and, and, 
you know, sharing that pain is, is, is fundamental because, God, you're asking them to, to give everything. So I, I think that's really important. I, I clearly don't believe in the adage of, of don't do business with friends. I've always done business with friends. In fact, I think that you know, it gives you a, an immediate leg up if you already have an unspoken interaction and understanding. And, and fundamentally, that's trust, right? Uh, working with Kevin, I trust him. Uh, frankly, I, I would probably, probably trust him more than myself to execute on most things that, that are, <laughs> are really important. And, and I think that's, you know, that again is something that you have to work at. It's not just a natural click that you, you obviously have a friendship that gave you that click, but you've got to revisit and, and retune and pay attention to that trust, which is a segue into when you talk about you know, your earliest customers, you, which, are, which are quite similar to your earliest employees, because in some ways your, your co-founder, right, they, they, they get equity with you and, and so they're probably bringing very complementary skill sets. But then when you're adding in employees, they're leaving comfortable jobs. They're probably rock stars in what they're doing. And so now you're really asking them to, to leave for something that, that, that you know, on, on the way, on the bus, on the way in, they never even thought about. And so, and the customers are the same way. Uh, it's, it's understanding what is, for an early stage employee, it's understanding what mark they want to make that they're not able to make in their current role like what meaning are they searching for and it's you know, perhaps starting to sound a bit deep but I think it's true like are they are they getting the the personal return from the investment they're making and we all spend you know a huge proportion if not the majority of our waking hours working so are you really getting the personal return from that 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 you had dreamed of doing I mean I've got a a four-year-old, two-year-old and a four-year-old. And I'm pretty sure my four-year-old at the moment is not aspiring to sit behind a laptop. And so where is that excitement and, and vocation to, to be involved? Similarly with those early customers, right? What is that problem that keeps them awake? What that's staring at the ceiling? And, and they might not even know what kind of solution they're looking for, but they know that there's something wrong there. And, and, and so the earliest customers, your, your evangelists, your, you know, those people that are going to be right at the pointy end of adoption that are going to in turn be the people that you will build your business from, empathy, understanding, sympathy, uh, under, uh, the, the, the comprehension of what they have to go through and not, not buy this product because I've built it and therefore buy it. It's let me really understand how your life works, how it's difficult. Rachel Newman, who's, who's worked at AWS and, and StubHub and has a fantastic history, has, has a mantra around look, do, ask. I think it, and, and the whole, you know, the idea behind that is really before you ask people what they, what they want, the old adage of, of Henry Ford saying, if I asked people what they wanted me to build, it would, they would have said a faster horse. You know, look what they are look at how they experience life, how they go through it, what, what, you know, write down the friction that is in their existence and then do it yourself and, and start to understand, you know, well, if I had to do this for, you know, 10 hours a day, every day, what would I be annoyed about? What would drive me crazy? And then finally ask them. And, and I think that'll start to give you a really good understanding and people, people maybe over dramatize this concept of product market fit. I mean, product market fit means you have listened really closely to your target customer's problem. And, it, and that could be you've experienced it, that could be you've observed it, and that could be you've asked for it. Hopefully it's all three, but you, you have lived it enough that you empathize that problem. And then product market fit is, you know, that's a byproduct because clearly when you start to build something that you believe would be a solution, it's going to fit the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Just on your point about Rachel, one of my favorite people in the startup space as well, my former boss, and she's one of the few people we've had on the show two times. So highly recommend listening back to her, to her interview as well. She's, yeah, she's, she's fantastic. Rachel's but, a rock star. Absolutely. To your point, you know, I, I spoke to, to Kevin about some of the early days of AgriWeb as well. And one of the things that he mentioned was, you know, he was on the road constantly speaking to, to a lot of the customers. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, farmers are by nature, sort of uh, adopters of technology, but as you mentioned, just do it in slightly different ways. And 
I guess for businesses that have been used to probably over multiple generations doing business in a particular way, having to change that approach can be a little bit difficult. And, you know, kind of translating that to some of the listeners of the show who are potentially in industries that are in, in a very similar sort of structure of traditionally operated in a particular way that they're trying to bring a new solution or, or a new way of working. Do you have any advice on how you can start finding those early adopters or how you can help bridge that gap between the way that they have been working to to what the future holds? Yeah, I mean, extrapolating on from, you know, the look to ask, the, the, that, that empathy, you, you've got to, there's very little that will replace good, a good product and building it. And I think, again, that comes down to people that you bring into the business. And I'd be remiss not to sort of give a shout out to Phil Chan, who's CTO and CPO at the moment, but Phil, who, who you know, brought along with him from IBM, Kenny Sabir and Eric Morenton, you know, these guys, along with a few others, uh, Lawrence Paul, others have just been fantastic at, at understanding, you know, the way that our, our early customers and our early potential customers were living. You know, they would get on the road. These are these are guys that you know have never been to a farm, and and you know they thought that what do you mean? Like I thought, yeah, you know, chicken or, or or beef or lamb just just was on a supermarket shelf. I didn't actually realize it, it was grown somewhere, and it, it was it was a living, breathing thing. And so getting out to there, having the the engineering development talent. The, the product management talent really start to understand the problem is a huge, huge advantage because then you're not trying to do this you know, through logic gates and through translation. You are, they're having an immediate understanding. And I remember an early engineer who, one of our earliest people who were with us, Coglin Baskarin, having just a, a long, quiet conversation with, with one of the ranchers about how he kept track of the sheep during shearing time and you know the the farmer just he was just talking about how he'd operate it and and how he kept track of them and how many numbers were sheared and, and you know Coggan was just quietly listening and, and absorbing and he came away and was able to immediately build a product that that you know could be rolled out across every farm for you know 85 million head of sheep across Australia just because they're able to, to have an understanding of how engineering works and adapt that to, to the problem. Now, to make the, you know, to make an answer perhaps or craft an answer that's more direct to, to what you're asking in finding those early people, I think that it, it, it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's not unearthing sort of a, a rough diamond somewhere. You, you know, if, you're, if you're uncovering a problem, and, and again, going through this process of, of, of really seeing it and understanding it, you don't necessarily, the, the, the idea that kernel doesn't have to be so universally world on fire that it's going to be really hard to find the customers. Frankly, if it is, you, you might need to want to rethink the complexity of your, of your solution. People have friction in their lives every day that they just deal with. And that's across a whole you know, litany of, of interactions. It doesn't have to be an antiquated industry. Sure, you know, take uh, digital healthcare, right? We, we absolutely, without thinking, would go to our GP and be treated by a GP and not think twice about the fact that that, you know, that information of whatever diagnosis or whatever issue that you had could be absolutely fundamental to diagnosing a bigger issue that you could have when you went to the hospital in six months' time. But the fact that the fragmented data data you know, resource that sat in on the desktop of your GP isn't connected to the hospital, and so therefore is never going to be a useful diagnostic input in in analysing you. It, it's it, the just simply connecting those two and understanding that has tremendous value in helping. You know, the, when you arrive at the hospital and and you've got a serious issue to, to start to determine it. Or it could be as, you know, as simple as what's the friction between when you commute to work and you walk in the front door, you know, people change shoes because their feet hurt. Well, is there a way to to make that better and make that uh, make that simpler? So I think finding these customers in antiquated industries 
is not necessarily the issue. It's it's understanding where the the friction is in life, at and hopefully that exists at scale, and then creating a solution for it. Whether that's hardware, software, marketplace, it, it really expands across across pretty much everything that we're doing in the tech solutions. I had a really fascinating conversation with Al Bentley from Simply Wall Street in my previous podcast last week. And one of the things that we were discussing was, you know, obviously there's, there's that approach of, you know, listening to your customers, but sometimes, especially at the early stages, the customer fit might not necessarily be there and their feedback on how they would potentially use the product or whether it's useful or not can be more detracting than useful in the sense of, you know, we would need these particular features that are only really useful for them or for a very small kind of customer case. I'm just wondering in that approach of when you are going out and talking to your customers, what are the things that you're sort of utilizing to identify these are really useful bits of feedback from the right type of customer from us versus drawing the line and saying, we're listening to them and we're understanding what they're saying, but potentially the feedback or or those sort of things mean that they're not quite the right customer for us at this stage. Great line of questioning. And, you know, I don't think that there is or are many examples of of getting this 100% right. We certainly haven't. And and I think, you know, determining what is a feature that needs to be built to solve a problem within your, you know, feature set and prioritizing that is, is a tricky skill because ultimately it's always a bit of a gamble. That said, you know, the more stack ranking you can do on... Is, is it one person that's telling you they have this problem? And if so, is that one person truly indicative of a big marketplace that you are trying to convert? Or are they just experiencing that as a temporal issue at that particular moment in time, place, situation? The, you know, and ultimately the software had, tends to have the vast majority of its users using about 10 to 20% of its total functional capability. You know, we all use Excel, and I bet you that the vast majority of us don't use anywhere near the full capability, and we're sort of amazed by Excel wizards, right? And, and, and that's a pretty ubiquitous piece of kit. It could go on, go on you know, Salesforce or, or Zero or Quicken or et cetera. All of these things, like we don't use it to its full capacity. And why? Because a lot of features have been built for very nuanced or particular needs. That said, right, the market is not the static thing, right? It's evolving over time. So sure, you're going to build stuff that may become redundant, or you may you might build stuff that doesn't have traction immediately, but becomes tremendously valuable you know, down the line. Or indeed, new markets and 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 applications for those features might become you know, front of mind. To give a more you know, palpable or tangible example, I, I mentioned them at, at, at the beginning, we have a fundamental issue of, of emissions, of greenhouse emissions from the production of food. And in particular, in our space, livestock management. Various estimates account say that the livestock production accounts for sort of 9 to 10% of total greenhouse emissions, which is an extraordinary amount, especially when you consider that livestock production in, in grazing, when actually implemented through correct rotational grazing practices, can be carbon negative. And that's untrue for almost any other industry, not reduce your carbon footprint, but actually be carbon negative. And I mean by, and what does that mean quickly as a tangent? It means that the regrowth of grass pasture captures more carbon from the atmosphere than the the animal, the cow or the sheep emits through through its room, through burping and farting. And so why am I bringing this up? One, because it's a really cool problem to work on. And two, because we built some features early days in AgriRib around that were quite particular to actually some farms in in Wales around measuring the feed wedge and and the pasture growth because they had very small fields and they they frankly needed to rotate their animals very quickly on very short order. And so one of the biggest friction points in their lives was remembering, oh man, I need to I need to move those animals on you know what day and I can't remember how many days they've been in and how much forage there is and so therefore you know could if I could have some alert that would remind me to move that well well what we 
you know, we were solving for a very specific problem in a very specific area. There aren't that many farmers in central Wales. And, and so therefore, you know, a lot of other farmers were not using that practice when they had big broad acre grazing. That said, when we now are facing carbon measurement, we can start to, to leverage that tool that measures the growth rate, the forage rate of or the growth of forage, and therefore calculate the amount of carbon that is sequestered by that regrowth of pasture. So totally different application. And what can we do with that? Well, we can actually start to establish the footprint, carbon footprint of that farm's livestock production. And if it is carbon negative, we can translate that into carbon credits, which ultimately are valuable to that farmer. And, is, and, and it can start to encourage the proliferation of regenerative grazing practices, which mean not just, go, not just are we saying, oh, goodness, like 9% of uh, global greenhouse emissions comes from livestock production, but we can bring it all the way. So that is, a, that is a negative number that, in fact, has carbon credits offsetting things like, you know, Microsoft server outputs or, or Bitcoin mining or, you know, mining for iron ore or bauxite. So there's some pretty awesome stuff that can come from this feature build, which means all the way back to your original question of you don't have to panic if you are building stuff that isn't immediately universally useful by all of your customer base. Sure, you want to prioritize what is most applicable, especially when you're at the early days and you're trying to solve critical problems. And frankly, you don't have that much funding to get things wrong and runway to get things wrong. But... You also don't have to panic. Sometimes mistakes aren't actually mistakes. They could come in useful down the road. And I'm a big proponent of you know, things like train wreck Tuesdays. Like go and ask people not what they did right, ask people what they did wrong, because it is much more important, particularly in the early stage of business, to avoid big errors than it is to get things right. It, the more errors you make, like no businesses ever went out of business by doing things right. They go out of business because they do things wrong and it costs a lot to do things wrong. So don't worry too much about it and have faith that you know, if you are, if you do have a good practice of understanding, of empathizing, of evaluating, of prioritizing, you'll probably be pretty close. And even if it's not close or correct now, it might well become so in the future. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of touching on team, it's just been fascinating to hear about the scale that you've been able to, to have already within a few short years, uh, 15 million head of livestock across 90 million acres around the world. And as of a, a funding round that you closed last year, now uh, the company is valued at north of $100 million. Congratulations on, on all of your progress and traction to date. I guess based off that, you know, we, we've kind of spoken a little bit about the early days of AgriWeb and, uh, you know, going out and, and trying to identify these needs of customers. As the companies continue to scale, how do you think about structuring the team and, and bringing the right people on board? And how has your role changed and evolved over time? Well, firstly, thank you very much. It's very kind. Very good of you to read out lots of vanity stats for us. You know, if I, <laughs> speaking of mistakes, I think we could, they would be far more plentiful than, than the 15 million head of livestock that are now on the platform. But, you know, yes, we are tremendously proud of, of you know, what we've, what we've done so far and the potential. I think you know, over my shoulder, we have our sort of mission statement, which is delivering the digital future of agriculture. And, and so, you know, 15 million head is, is, is really just a milestone on a much longer journey that we're hoping to, hoping to realize. What, is, what does that mean in terms of business? Like you know, our you know, users of the products, like farmers are increasing their productivity sort of seven and a half percent year on year. And, and, and that's massive for us as a society to, to see productivity increases such that this is our food. And this is also concurrently our environment. So of course we want our productivity and our efficiency sustainably increased. Now in terms of the team, but I am unbelievably humbled and, and it's, it's easy to say, but, but it, it, it's so impressive to experience on a daily basis that the, we've got about 58 people in the Agri team. We have boots on ground, a, like a team in London, Belfast, over in Denver and Colorado. We've also got boots on ground in South Africa and some representatives in Brazil. So, you know, it, it is a very global team, which has its own challenges. Recruitment, you know, we've built out the basically the entire US team without having ever met any of them yet in person, thanks to COVID. And 
it, it says something massive about the concept of how can we translate culture from you know Australia across to to Denver, Colorado, to people that have never met us. And I think that's been both a challenge, but an incredibly rewarding reality of not imposing our culture, but hopefully showing, hey, this is how we really like working, and and how do you you know how can we bring you guys on that journey and and what what do you want to add to it that could be awesome as well so you know i think those bits have been have been amazing clearly to your question around what you know what do i do what do the founders do as a business evolves i think we all have our own style the so long as we can make sure that we're still being additive to the business <laughs> you know quite quickly we can become a handbrake and uh, I'm not certainly not adverse to being told go away. <laughs> you're, you're you're hurting, not helping. The the role that that at least I play is is very much out facing, dealing with stakeholders in our business, whether it's investors, you know, welcoming Telus, which is a very large Canadian telco uh, equivalent to sort of Telstra Canada. They themselves have have are at the big early stages of the agricultural journey. They earmarked multi-billion dollar investment into this, into the digitization of agriculture and have acquired eight companies and, and now have a, you know, a team of 3,000 people already in that division. And they've done that in 18 months, two years. So they're certainly not letting the grass grow under their feet and, and working with them as well as the CEFC, which is the Clean Energy Finance Corp. You know, they have a major drive to, a singular drive, frankly, to reduce carbon emissions. But beyond that, it's also big customers like Cargill and, and Microsoft and Merck and Zoetis and, and Sainsbury's and Tesco's and Woolworth's and all these groups that, you know, connect into the farm production unit, whether it's, you know, supplying stuff to farms, whether it's servicing them through finance or insurance or advice, or whether it's, you know, who a farmer sells to, supermarkets, processors, packers, that sort of thing. You know, I try to engage with the leaders of those businesses to help them understand, you know, who are we? Why, when you run Cargill, largest privately owned business, uh, one of the largest privately owned businesses in the world with literally hundreds of thousands of employees, you know, why do they need a small software business in Australia? And, and how can we you know, help really help them reach their goals? And, and that's probably something that I'm uniquely positioned to be able to do. Whereas, frankly, I couldn't do uh, the vast majority of execution jobs in the business because you know, we've been fortunate enough to hire some fantastically talented engineers well, right the way through the stack, marketing, sales, success, support, engineering, product, and then, you know, finance, people in culture, um, all of those people have specialist skills. And I think that's what you start to evolve when you hit series B, series C, is you really need to understand that as a founder, you, you can't do everything. And frankly, you're not going to be as good as the people you've hired into those spots. So, Focus on hiring really, well, really, really well and give them autonomy and freedom to be good at what they're good at. And then you, know, you serve to make them, you, know, you serve at their pleasure because your whole existence is to, is to make it easy for them to execute on what they're good at. Absolutely. Great advice. One thing that Chris mentioned to me that really sort of stuck out to him from even the early days of AgriWeb was the culture that you had built up in the company. He told me a story about a Christmas party early on where instead of going to the pub, you went to Centennial Park and uh, had a bunch of jumping castles and games for kids, you know, which which I think is, is obviously a great way of ingraining a, a large part of the, the team together and really kind of sharing the family first culture that you've built in, inside the company. You know, obviously you touched on COVID and there will be a number of founders that are listening to this that have hired remotely and haven't met team members or haven't had the opportunity to do what they would normally do in terms of being able to translate that culture. How has AgriWeb approached that, especially in a context of, as you mentioned, hiring a bunch of new team members in the US that you haven't had an opportunity to, to meet with face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I mean, it, it's that family first concept. When Kevin and I really, and John founded the business, like the we we knew that we weren't 22 years old and this wasn't going to be come and work 125 hours a week <laughs> and it, you know it was a marathon not a sprint and and you know that matched up a lot with we wanted to have people have a long tenure in the business so the, the standard turnover of particularly engineers in in the valley is 16 months and and you know i think that is sure there's there's numerous financial opportunities and and you know, 
flurry of interest, but there's also just a cultural chasm there, right? That it's the, the idea of burnout and running as fast as you can for as long as you can before you fall over. I, I, I don't necessarily buy into that. You know, I say that from a position of experience, having worked on Wall Street and done those hours and et cetera. I think we wanted to recognize not just we want you to be on this journey for a long time, but also who are the people that are going to go on that journey with you? And that's family members. And so, you know, how does it benefit your your partner, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your children, your extended family, all of the people in your ecosystem that you care for and care about? Like, how does it benefit them if you go, oh, cool, I'm going to a Christmas party, we're going to go to a pub and get blind. Like, it's, you know, it's fun and it's a release, but it, it doesn't include them. And then they don't really understand the culture of what you're trying to, to do. And when you leave and you're, you're, you know, when you're working towards that goal every day, you want them you want them on that journey with you. You want to come home and celebrate the wins with the people that you love. And that's true regardless of where you sit in the organization. And if people are tied into that culture, how much more powerful and how much more motivated are you going to be to actually engage? And frankly, when the going does get hard and you've got to take that conference call at, at 10 p.m. Um, or, or much later or much earlier or, or get, you know, get on the keyboard to 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 push out to ship out that that new release and that new feature that you know happens at two in the morning. There's you have a partner who's who sort of understands why. And and I think you know, someone who hasn't come up a lot in in this in this chat, uh, Kevin and my third co-founder John Fargo, like he's tremendously motivated by this this concept of the why. What are we doing? So tying that across to how how does one engage a remote team? It's about clearly articulating, communicating, and re constantly reinforcing the why. It, it's not. It's not cool. We'll come up with you know some value statements, whack them on a poster, and and that's going to motivate everyone. You know that doesn't. You know, that doesn't. That doesn't motivate anyone. It's. It, it's about understanding the why and having that really part of the fabric of of, of what you're doing. It's the interaction, the honesty, the openness you have with your team, whether it's remote or in person, and 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 living that same concept of why are we doing this, and what, who are we doing it for, and why do they care? And I think that's always going to be you know, a much greater motivator than than any kind of financial realization you know that will come about. If it does lead to a financial gain, awesome. But invariably, people work for the why more than they do for the what. One of the important things that to, to add to you know any any entrepreneur and any startup is to is to be really conscious of your support team the the people around you that you love are going through this journey just as much as you are and you're asking a lot of them <laughs> you know my my wife Victoria and I've got two children a two-year-old and a four-year-old you know, uh, she has been absolutely you know, extraordinary as a consigliere for me when when I don't know how to make or what decision to make as as a consult when times are tough as a as a cheerleader when things are going well you know the ability to to have your you know to have your team at home really on on side is something that's amazing and it's something that you've got to recognize and and pay back to because they're going through this hardship just as much as you yet they're disconnected from it and whether it is your partner or your parents or your or your roommates or your friends it's you know they, they it is a difficult journey and they are on it just as much as you so i definitely want to shout out to my wife uh, that she's she's awesome and my parents equally have been amazing so i'm i'm very lucky to be surrounded by that awesome network and and i hope that any entrepreneur that goes on this journey is fortunate enough to have the same Absolutely. One of the final questions, uh, because I feel like I can talk to you all day. Kevin mentioned that, uh, you know, he described you as Mr. Blue Sky, as someone who really has a really big vision for, for the future. Really curious from your perspective, and, you know, you've mentioned that the 15 million is, you know, just a milestone for you. Where do you see the future for AgriWeb and ag tech in general? Kevin probably would like, love for me to get out of the blue sky sometimes and actually get into the, the, the operational realization of stuff. I think I do, I, frankly, I do love to, to spend a fair bit of time thinking about where we can go and therefore seeding those kernels, planting those seeds of, of you know, the redwood tree that can, that can grow long beyond us. When I left BlackRock, you know, which is a 
big asset management company. I remember one of the leaders of the Aussie business turning to be like, oh, look, Webb's going to go and do sort of, you know, some sort of tech business for cows. Like, are you going to make, you're going to do Tinder for cows? And, and, and it was clearly a very disdainful comment about, you know, why would technology be useful in agriculture? And, and I think whatever it is, five, seven years later, it, it, this is a major industry. And it's and in fact, it's becoming its own sector. It's not, it's not technology to facilitate agriculture. Like ag tech in and of itself is becoming similar to mining services. This is its own sector. And as recently as yesterday, when Farmer's Edge IPO'd in, in Canada and immediately you know, jumped 23% in the first day, seeing, seeing a tremendous interest and excitement. I mean, we are talking about some of the most some of the most robust, consistent problems in 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 our for our society, and and this is an existential problem. We need to produce enough food to feed a growing world uh, that that is expanding exponentially, slowing but has been exponential, and and so. We, you know, we, we have limited resources to do that. And, and there's a whole multitude of solutions and opportunities that, that can start to come together in this world of ag tech to realize efficient, sustainable production of food. And, and we, we as consumers are demanding at the same time to understand more about where our food was produced, what happened to it, you know, was it grown in an ethical way? And I don't just mean that about animal production, because even if you're vegan or, or, or have particular diets that are confined only to plant, like that still means that you are eating something that was produced in fields that, you know, cleared away biodiversity, because typically monocultural production has been the signature of modern agriculture. And you, know, you don't have to watch many David Attenborough films to recognize the impact of, of monoculture on soil diversity, on the yield from the land, on, you know, on fundamentally our, our ecology and ecosystem and our place within that. So where do I think we can go with this? I mean, I think that we have a responsibility for this to be absolutely central to our you know, mindset. And I mean that as a society, I mean it from, from superannuation investment, it needs to be central, not just in investing in renewable energy, that's great, but what about investing in, in, in agricultural production in a more sustainable way, and frankly, having punitive elements of saying we won't import food that, doesn't, that isn't certifiably sustainable. Actually having punitive elements of we're not going to accept more clearing of land in you know, Latin America for, for new agricultural development of soybean or, or livestock. So all of these things can come from, from ag tech. And all of these things are an incredibly central focus that I genuinely would struggle to see a more important requirement of our society for the longevity of our society beyond ourselves. And, and so therefore, yeah, my blue sky is firmly focused on on what we can do and what we can realize, because I, I just don't see a bigger problem for us than this one that's staring right, right, <laughs> firmly in in our face. Absolutely. And to, to wrap up as well, I know that I, as I mentioned, I could really talk to you all day. You, you know, it's, it's really interesting what you mentioned in terms of the passing comment when you were sort of starting off AgriWeb as well when you left BlackRock. And it's you know really interesting seeing your successful track record across a number of different industries as well. I know we didn't really get a chance to touch on this, but you're a, you're a keen and active investor as well. Really keen to understand from your experience or, or from, your, from your perspective, what are some of the commonalities that make or themes that make the successful business opportunities that founders should look for? Yeah, it's, uh, look, I think that a lot of them have come up in, in the discussion that we've walked through, right? Demonstration, clear demonstration of, an, of you know, not just a discovery of, but a real understanding and 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 an empathy for a uh, word that I keep using for the problem that you are solving. A founding founder or founding team that is totally committed to to really doing this. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have to have domain expertise or or particular excellence in it. It just means that they are really committed to to the why of of doing it. Ideally, some demonstrated execution is something that I think is very important when backing early stage teams. And, and you know, I, I have a predication to, to seek out female founders to try and encourage that 
degree of diversity in in our in our sphere. I think both ethnic minorities and female founders need to be better represented. They need to be better backed. They haven't, that problem has not been, you know, addressed directly or even passively by a lot of the call it institutional investment of venture capital or across the space. And you see that in the statistics. So yeah, uh, you know, if, if, if the confluence of events could come together to back, to back that kind of person, then I am I'm very excited to do it and, and would encourage also, you know, whether that whether it's people thinking about getting into startups or whether it's people that are in it but are thinking about doing their own their own concept or or or, or whether it's actually you know younger people that are trying to work out, you know, is this the right area for them? I mean, I I I can't I, I can't purport it enough as being an amazing journey. And and Failure within that journey is is certainly not failure. In fact, you learn a tremendous amount from from day one of doing this, and it's life skills, it's personal confidence, it's something that that you know things can't take away, things that cannot be taken away from you, regardless of the commercial success or failure of your of your venture. They are amazing experiences, and so I would be more than happy to chat with people who are seeking to or, or wanting to rip into it because it's an awesome journey. Absolutely. On that note, Justin, for anyone who wants to find out more about AgriWeb or potentially join you on the journey, what's the best way for them to do that? Please, please reach out to the website, agriweb.com. And um, would love to hear from you, learn more about you. And if, if, you're, if you're passionate about or could be passionate about, you know, feeding the world sustainably, well, you know, this, this may be the vocation for you. But uh, regardless of that, like, even if you just want to have a bit of a chat of, of where your next steps are, you know, I, Kevin, John, Phil, Kenny, Eric, uh, the whole lot, we're, we, we love mentoring and, and, and love getting in touch with people who are passionate about something. And, and driven. So, you know, let us, let us help you if, if we can. And, and, and if not, then you can ignore us and that'd be even better. <laughs> Amazing. On that note, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience and insights, Justin. It's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. I hope I haven't rambled too much, but I've tremendously enjoyed the time with you and um, with your listeners. So thank you so much. Look forward to seeing if I can come back on with Rachel in the future. Uh, we, we definitely need to make that happen. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, man. See you. Thanks for listening to episode 143 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.